Well, it's needless to say, this church has been through a lot lately. And not some little things, some big things. And even when the big things have happened, that does not mean that the little things stop happening. They also keep happening. And the realization is there's going to be a lot more things happen. And they will continue to happen until either God calls you home to be with him or he returns. Things spiritually are going to get better or should be getting better for each one of us. But pain and heartache awaits us all to one degree or another in what remains in our lives. So as I was thinking about that, we're not actually doing uh, from here to there. I guess you could call it that. But we're, we're going to focus more on this aspect of when life doesn't really go right in a certain point of view. In another point of view, it's, it is going the way God said it would go. And helping us overcome some of this difficulty. And so I've, I've turned us to a passage of a Christian who's considered a model. This, this individual is a model Christian. How do I know they're a model Christian? Because, turn with me, chapter 3, verse 17, maybe you don't even have to turn a page. Brethren, now when you read that word, don't disassociate you from it. He's, Paul is talking to you. Okay? Brethren, be followers together of me. Paul is inviting you to model your life after him. All right? And then there may even be some in your lifetime, mark them that are model believers. Over in chapter 4 and verse 9, he says, those things which ye have seen, both learned, received, heard, and seen in me do. The thing <clears throat> and the God of peace shall be with you. So he's, he's inviting us to mimic himself. He's the only one in the Bible authorized to say that. Peter is never authorized to say, follow me. And I'm not saying these individuals who I'm going to name led something less than a life to be emulated, but they're never given the authority to say it. John, John the gospel writer, John the epistle writer, John the revelator, never given a chance, never told to say, emulate my life. James, never told it. Paul is. So Paul is a model believer. What is he a model believer of? Well, look at chapter 3 and verse 15. Let us therefore as many as be, what? Perfect, that's the word mature. Paul, if we combine those thoughts that God breathed out, Paul is the model believer of maturity. So whatever topic is covered in this epistle, Paul, God is telling you, Paul is a model of a mature believer in this category. All right? He's given this. And what is one of the things... Paul, who is a model believer of maturity, what's one of the things he himself desires that he's going to model a mature response in? Chapter 3, verse 9, Paul says, And to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, which no man can keep, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, that's not talking head knowledge, 
Let's talking experiential knowledge. Like you get to know your spouse. Like you get to know your new neighbor. You get to know your children. You get to know the new person in church. That's You get to know them by experiencing. You're associating with them. It's not that you go to Google them and you get all kinds of facts about them. That's not this word. That's another word. All right? So Paul is asking to experience Jesus Christ, and it's what he's asking to experience him in that it shows his maturity, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, amen, everybody is looking forward to that, and the fellowship of his what? Now that's not common. I, I can't remember since I've been at this church on that prayer sheet in the back that any one of us had prayed that we would be conformable to Christ's sufferings. And I, I, I'm, I'm condemning myself. That is not a normal prayer request. But God said that's a mature Christian's request. That we would be conformable to Christ's sufferings, and he suffered. Not any time as a result of his fault. He suffered for our transgressions. He was bruised because of our iniquities. But Paul wants to know, I want to be able to respond like Christ responded. Responded. Christ never went off in a tangent. He never said to his followers, don't you know you're killing me? And he could have said that literally, couldn't he? So he, here's this mature response. And, and, and Paul is highly esteemed by God for the things that he is emulating and demonstrating in his life. And you, you think about what's going on in Paul's life. Paul's writing this. This letter to the Philippians, for the past four years, so 2018, so four years, 2014, just picture yourself, 2014, chained to a Roman guard 36 inches apart. And every six hours, a new Roman soldier opens his, clamps it on to the next guy, and the next guy sits down, and for the next six hours, he's your buddy. And then that guy gets up, and he clamps it on. And for four years, that's what you do. Now, Paul was an active guy. That Look at, don't do it now, recall the maps in the back of your book of your Bible, and almost all of them have several of them. One of them is the journeys of Paul, his missionary trips, usually one, two, and three. And look where he traversed. He was walking, he was active, and he saw sunsets, he saw sunrises, just like you and I. And you and I would stop at various times and we would just drink that in. I'm assuming Paul did too. But that's over. He hasn't seen that in four years. And prior to him getting chained up, he was shipwrecked on an uh, island, suffering great catastrophe over there. And who knows how long he spent there before he was delivered to Rome to do his prison term. That's the backdrop to Paul saying, God, I want to know how your son suffered. And he's not being sadistic. He wants to have fellowship through those things. And, and look, at, look at this mature mindset, verse 8. And yea, doubtless, and I count all things but what? Wow. Being able to walk, go wherever I want. If this is where God wants me, I count my freedom as ex excrement. That's the word he uses. If this is what I need, then I count the rest as excrement. I count it as dung. If I don't see another sunrise, if I don't see another sunset, if I never walk uh, 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 by myself again, if I never do this, if I never do that, I, I count it as loss. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> Why? Verse 15, so that I can be perfect. So that I can be mature. So Paul is here and he's telling us to follow him. So my question to myself was this, do I have a mature attitude? Well, I have a strike against me. I've never prayed for suffering. I've never prayed to be conformed to that. So I'm missing something. There's something that's not registered in my head. And the thing that hasn't registered in my head is something God has said that would allow me to confidently and joyfully pray that prayer. There's some word, some words that God has spoken that is not keeping my mind. Do you remember the series, Quieting a Noisy Soul? Jim Berg, we're going to do that again. We're going to do it on a Sunday night. I don't know. We're going to do chunks at a time. We're not going to do the whole thing. That's 26 weeks. But there's parts of it. Pastor Corey, I need to remind myself to keep saying that. Pastor Corey and I have been reviewing that, and we need it. All right? We need it. He says unbelief is a disorder. Talk about all the disorders people have. Dis unbelief is one of them because it accepts the reasoning of fallen man over the revelation of God. And that's what we've done. We don't pray for suffering because we have bought in to what man thinks about it and not what God has revealed to us about it. And that's the problem. And that's why so many people are being led astray by many preachers on TV and radio that just are painting this rosy picture, and that's not true. And that's why people become disillusioned with Christianity, because you're painting a picture God never painted. So here we have God des describing this for us. And I learned this this past week. Think of the material, Paul, that the New Testament is occupied that is the result of Paul. From chapter 9 to chapter 28 of the books of Acts, which is the history of the early church, is Paul. Do you know there are 260 chapters in your New Testament and if you include Paul as the author of the book of Hebrews, approximately 100 of those chapters are, he's the author? That's a lot of stuff. So Paul is a mature and he is this modeled believer, all right? So what is it that I missed that Paul understands that I need to really grasp. And I'm not going to say, we're not, we already read the verse. It wasn't new to you. But I, and I'm not saying you've missed it, but apparently I've missed everything, the, the, the complete context of it, because I've not prayed this way. This isn't totally in my soul, is what I'm saying. Verse 6 of chapter 4. We're going to talk about weary, worrying. The verse starts out, be careful. That's the word for worry. That's the word for agony. That's the word for um, just distraught, full of care. He says, don't do that. But in everything, this is all encompassing. What, what he's going to struck me on instruct me in, I'm worrying that this is a universal application. What part of your life materially, emotionally, financially, relationship-wise, what part of your life 
have you not given an appropriate amount of time over to, and therefore you are anxious about it? What part of your life you have, because you haven't had the time to get God's mindset on it, you become anxious over it. You're worrying about it. You're extremely concerned about it. That's what God's going to talk about. And God uses a word in these passages that equates to the English word of agony. And there are six or seven topics, one of them being prayer, that is an agony. And God mentions no words that say that agony is going away. In other words, it is agonizing sometimes to pray, not the actual form of it, but what you have to pray for. And that's probably why many Christians don't pray. But the point being, there's six or seven of those, and we went through a study, we, we did the study on agony, and the point is, it's not going away. Until God comes back, Jesus comes back, or you go to be with him. So we need God's mind on this. We do not need to walk around as a bunch of anxious, worried, loaded people. It's like Ezra. Ezra, do you want help on your way back to uh, Jerusalem from Babylon? No, we've been bragging to the king that our God takes care of the righteous and will punish the unrighteous. We can't go back and say, yeah, our God does that, but send your army anyway. That looks like you're trusting in who? Well, we tell people we can do all things through Christ except for this. How do I know we can't do that? Because I'm worrying about it. Right? And we're contradicting ourselves, not with our words, but with our lives. So Paul is going to address that. We're not going to escape the agonizing parts of life. So we better get God's mind on how we're to approach it. So chapter 6, chapter 4, verse 6, this is awesome. You ready? Be careful. Be anxious. Do you know that's an imperative? That's a command. And you're thinking, lay it on me, pastor. Be anxious. Tell me what I can be anxious for. Come on, tell me I can be for my children, my money, my retirement, my job, my neighbors. Come on, I'll memorize this list. Oh, this is one list I'll get down. Be anxious. I've been waiting for you to say something about what I can be anxious for. It's a command. Don't disobey God. So what is it? What's, what, what does God command me to be anxious over? It's not an option. And it's not that God says you don't have any cares. Jesus himself in Matthew 6, so first sermon, he doesn't even get 15 minutes in and he says, I acknowledge you have cares. I know you have necessities of life. What you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, and what you're going to wear. I know you have these concerns in your life. All right? And we're not like they were. They were concerned about the things of the, the, the money, the stuff, because they didn't have it today. Now, none of us are worried about what we're going to eat today, but some of us are worried about what we're going to eat in a month or next week. Many of us are not worried about our money today, but some of us are worried, will we have any in five years? Some of us aren't worried about what we're going to wear today. We, we got it on, but some of us are concerned about what we're going to wear next this summer. God acknowledged these things, but he absolutely forbids us to worry about them. 
We are forbidden to worry about these things. That's Jesus' instructions to us. Paul says, yeah, you got the cares, the things you eat, drink. And you also wrote uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you're married, you got the care of your spouse. That adds another dimension to possibilities to worry about. You're concerned about how do they feel about me, what they need, meeting their needs. Paul, God acknowledges that. And then it comes along to the children. If you have children, then you worry about them. And then the grandchildren, the, you, it, it opens all up. And then Paul says in 2 Corinthians verse 11, we'll, we'll get, or chapter 11, we'll get there eventually in our study. Paul says, and besides all this, I've got the cares of the church on me. And I can't even imagine that. God puts all these possibilities to become anxious burdens, cares, but he prohibits me from becoming anxious in my mind. So what, what then should I be doing if I'm forbidden to do this? Be careful for nothing, but in, it's just as universal as the prohibition what can I pray about if you're anxious? Well, what's the Bible allow you to pray for? And everything by prayer, all right? And there's going to be four steps to this. Sometimes if you read certain commentaries, they, they lump all these words. They say they're synonyms, and they basically mean the same thing. And it's been made aware to me that that's probably not the case. What Paul's talking with that first word, prayer, is more of an attitude, okay? For example, the other day I was out uh, to breakfast, I believe, breakfast or lunch with another pastor who has teenage and 10-ish age children. We were eating and he got the phone call and, you know, you could hear on the other end, somebody was very upset. And they were just, I mean, I don't know what they're saying, but ah! And his dad said, calm down. I can't what? I can't understand. And blah, 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 calm down. And finally, after about three minutes, seriously, they calmed down and they were able to speak. When God says in everything by prayer related to anxiety, be a worry, Sometimes you're all, we're all frantic with God. Go, 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 go. And God said, calm down. Get prayerful so I can understand you. Right? Get prayerful. I know you have cares. Get prayerful. Instead of going off the deep end, gather your mind, corral your thoughts, and get prayerful. And everything by prayer and supplication. That's the word supplicant. A word that pictures a beggar. And a great example was shared with me of Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was a missionary from England. He was studying and became a doctor. And while he was still over in England, apparently this man came up to him and Hudson Taylor had just received some money. Okay? And doctors back then weren't what they are now. Okay? They weren't walking around in all the fancy hubbaloo. They got paid an honest salary and that was it. So he, and he's going to be a missionary. So he gets this money and this guy comes, Hudson Taylor, would you come to my, my apartment? And he gets to his apartment and there sits his wife holding this baby boy who apparently is about 36 hours old. And then these other children come out and you can tell, apparently Hudson can tell by the way they look, the, this family was in destitute need. And the baby wasn't being cared for as he ought to. And the guy looked at him and just said to Hudson Taylor, 
Please, God, if you can help us, help. What was that guy doing? He was a supplicant. He, he had nothing. He wasn't conniving. Well, I could pick up an extra shift. I could do that. He didn't have, that was, those weren't options. And that day in England, you were assigned a class and you were assigned what job. And that was it, buddy. That's all you went. So if Hudson Taylor doesn't take the coin out of his jacket pocket and put it in that guy's hand, that guy has nothing. That's a supplicant. Get prayerful. And when you come, to, and God will wait till you come to the end of your rope. When you realize you've got nothing. And hopefully, see, here's the key. Not spending too much time in that trying to connive something stage. Because we're always trying to do back room deals in our mind, Right? If God doesn't do this, I'm, I'm going to pray, but if God doesn't do it, I'm going to, here are my next 10 steps. Well, you're not a supplicant. You've got a plan. By everything, by prayer and supplication. Oh, supplicant. Oh, almost missed this. Turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. This will help us. Verse 8, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere. Here's what I want to get. Lifting up. What kind of hands? Holy hands. And your hands won't be holy if you're conniving. It's just amazing to me in studying God's word how many times God gives us what we ask for, good or bad. If you reach up with impure hands, then don't expect God to answer it. With a conniving backup plan in your mind, most likely you're going to get that one. And most likely, that isn't going to turn out as you anticipated. Lift up holy hands. And I invite you to come out Wednesday night, lift your holy hands up with the holy hands that are here, and let's make supplication to God. So God, he tells us here, supplication, then with what? Thanksgiving. Be what? Why? Well, here's another chance to show me your faith. Because I'm going to start a quotation and everyone in this room is going to be able to finish it, some verbatim and some paraphrase. All thanks... God will test you. Do you really mean that? Some of these things that cause anxiety are part of those all things. And what is the goal of that in Romans 8, 28? To conform you into the image of God's Son. Just what Paul prayed in Philippians 3, 10, that I be conformed to the image of? Well, part of Jesus' confirmation of being conformed was he suffered. What's he doing on the cross at the peak? No one will ever suffer like this. You will never bear your own sins, let alone anybody else's. What's he doing on that cross? Well, he's talking to some people, and he's talking to who? God. 
please what? Please forgive them. Then he's talking to the two next to him. One's railing on him and the other one's saying, hey, remember me, you're, you're coming with me. He's leading him to the kingdom of God. So there's a, there's a level I can be at in the midst of my troubles. Philippians, you, you can write this down, Philippians 5, 8, be thankful in everything. Ephesians 5, 20, be thankful for everything. Be thankful in everything, be thankful for everything. That about covers what? Covers it all. And I'm not up here saying, yeah, I've been so grateful the past two months. I'd be lying to you. But that's where God wants me. That's where God wants you. And we don't care how the world responds. The world is supposed to respond. And I'm not even going to, I'm not even necessarily caring about other Christians because they have a pastor that has to look over. I'm caring about us. And I know we've had our share. We've really had our share. And do I think it's over? No, it's not. God nowhere tells me in this word that it's over. So I want to grow. I want to do better at the things God wants me to do better at. And it's my response to things that can cause me to be anxious, worried, or troubled. But in everything, prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And then what? The peace of God which passeth all understanding, shall guard, shall garrison. Your what? Your heart and, because it's my mind that's spinning. Right? My heart may be broken, but it's my mind spinning. Now you can make your request. So I go from blah, 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 to peace of God. Now I'm able to talk to God, but most importantly, why don't you instruct your kids when they're <laughs> why don't you instruct them when they're doing that? How much do they get? Nothing. You calm them down, and when they're ready to receive instruction, you what? Talk to them. Well, where are we getting that from? God. And what we expect out of young people, we ought to expect out of ourselves with God. And that peace is going to keep you. We covered this Wednesday, Tuesday night. No, Wednesday night. Isaiah 1, 16 and 17. Cease to do evil. And here's the part. Learn to do good. Learn. That means I'm going to, have to put some effort in this. Now, God can graciously take things away but sometimes he takes it away using the learning process. And that's where I need to be. Now, I'm sharing this because I believe it could encourage a bunch of us, myself included. Have you ever prayed for suffering? I never have. I'll be honest, it never has once entered my mind. But a model, mature believer can pray it. Not sadistically, in a God honoring way, in which he learns, she learns to suffer 
in a Christ-like way, knowing these things. And that's why Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom. Not seek ye first the answers to your anxiety, because that's we prioritize our day. Oh, I got to get this and this and this done. Bible reading, ah, if I get to it. And God says, no, that's not if you get to it. You're going to be messed up at the end of the day if that's your priorities. Seek first the kingdom. Get yourself calm. Make your supplications and your requests. Make it known. The peace of God that keeps other hearts will keep yours. And then go out and live your day. It'll be a much different day. And that's what he's asking us to do. And surely, folks, you know somebody right now anxious, troubled, worried, banging their head against the wall, whatever you want to use. And they're a believer. God has a word for them. God has, in, God has a command. Stop it. Stop doing that. If you think I can do all things, then I can or I can't. You can't have it both ways. Get in a prayerful spirit. And it, it, folks, isn't that the last thing we, comes to our mind in an anxious time for a lot of us? To stop and pray. And it's un-American to think you need anything. God says, you have nothing. And until you realize that, you're not going to ask the way you should. And be thankful that came to you. Now, that may take some time, but be grateful for it. God's using it. And then watch out because the peace is coming. Let's stand.